Today I'd like to continue my talks about onion theory by talking about the Romazons in onion theory. And I know this may be esoteric to people that are interested in fancier things, but this is an, an important way that onion theory distinguishes itself from quark theory. And if you haven't walked it's one of my previous talks on quark theory, um, or an onium theory. Basically, an onium theory, it starts with a positronium model of an electron-positron that rotates relativistically. And Milne and later Feynman and Sternglass found out that, that this relativistic positronium is equal to a neutral pion. And the mass of the neutral pion is entirely relativistic. And using that idea of an onium model, you can develop an entire particle model that doesn't require quarks. And the Romazons are a great example of how well the onium theory works without needing quarks. So, to begin with, they have similar masses. The charge row has a mass of 775.11 while the neutral row has a mass of 775.26. Uh, so very close. They're not that precisely well known because both of these row mesons has a very short uh, mean lifetime. And then they both decay primarily to two pions. And this is kind of interesting because in the quark model, the row mesons are essentially an excited pion but they decay primarily to two pions, which doesn't make any sense. If you're an actual physicist, you should look at the decay products to tell you what a resonance is made of. And so that's the first clue. But the second clue is that the positive charge pion is charged rho meson, is made of three charged pions and a neutral pion because it can decay to that too. So that conflicts with two pions being the most common decay mode, but we have to account for how that occurs. And then the neutral row can decay to four charged pions, two pairs that are oppositely charged, or one oppositely charged pair and a neutral pion and two neutral pions. So once again, we have a four pion decay mode that we have to account for. Now, in quantum field theory, if there's excess energy during particle decay, a quantum fluctuation can be excited, an electron-positron pair. Uh, but when electron-positron pair gets excited, it predominantly produces a neutral pion. Uh, it, or separate electrons and positrons, of course. Uh, so, if these extra pions were coming from electron, positron, quantum electron, positron, quantum fluctuation, and excitation, you would expect to see um, more three pion decay modes where you would have an extra uh, neutral pion being produced. And so, we don't see it in the percentages that we would expect. So these four pion decay modes indicate that the row really has four pions. And now we can point out that a positive and negative pion, given a little more than 210 MeV per C squared of relativistic energy, forms a can, a neutral can. And, and that's important for the next step because we can add up the masses of a neutral kaon, a charged pion, and a neutral pion and to estimate the mass of a charged Romanzon, and that gives us 772.16 MeV per C squared. So it's almost exactly the, the, math, the known mass. And we just simply do it by adding up the mass of the components. And then for the neutral row, we add up the mass of the neutral kaon again. 
and then two charged pions, and we get a mass of 776.75, which is within one and a half MeV per C squared of the correct mass. We can also add up the mass of a neutral kaon and two neutral pions, and that gives us a mass of approximately 767 MeV per C squared, which is a little bit lower than the known row mass, but the uh, neutral pions will couple magnetically to increase the total energy slightly, um, and that can make up the difference. So we actually have two different possible models for the neutral row, one that has two neutral pions and one has an opposite the charged set of pions in addition to the cation. And I drew these examples here where we have a pion orbited by a pion orbited by two pions forming a kaon. Now to be proper, the kaon orbits are going to be smaller than the pion orbits because they're more energetic. So in reality, the two outer pion orbit is probably less than the size of the pion. And so, but, but that would be difficult to draw, so I just draw it this way. Um, and then we have, in this case, a neutral pion orbited by an electron-positron pair, which equals another neutral pion, and then orbited by a, uh, another pion, two pion pair forming a neutral pion. And then in the charge case, we just have a neutral pion in the middle, orbited by a charged pion, orbited by two oppositely charged pions forming a kaon again. So this is what it looks like in ammonium theory. We have a simple model of basically three particles that are co-located or nested in their orbits, and that gives us the proper mass and gives us the decaying products of the rho meson. And it all fits together nice and neat without using quarks. So to summarize, we either have two or four pion decay, but we have plenty of reasons to believe that four pi n is correct. In most particular, that the mass uh, adds up to having four pi ions in this configuration. And then quarks are completely unnecessary. And an unnecessary complication to make things worse. Um, and to understand the problems with quark theory, or even worse than that, um, a neutral pion is supposed to have the same formula as, not, the neutral row is supposed to have the same formula as a neutral pion, which, which makes no sense. As I mentioned in previous videos, this is problematic because an up and any up equals zero and a down and any down equals zero. So this is zero divided by the square root of two, which isn't a particle at all. And up onium and down onium are not known to exist, so it's not like we can substitute them in. Uh, and elementary particles shouldn't be divisible by the square root of two, even if they didn't previously annihilate. And you shouldn't be able to subtract an elementary particle from an elementary particle. That makes absolutely no sense. So this whole formula is irrational. It's total nonsense. And that should have been a big clue that the quark theory was total nonsense, uh, especially with regard to describing the mesons. And it's much, you can describe all the mesons this way and it works out a, a whole lot easier. Um, and then we do have, for the charge uh, row, you have an up and an any down or a down and an any up for the two different types of charged rows, which once again, while it doesn't have the complications of this equation, it, it's just totally unnecessary. So, the quark theory is totally unnecessary. And as I said, it's unnecessary for all the mesons and, and also for all the baryons. Well, I hope you enjoyed this talk. And I hope you now understand more reasons why we should question the quark theory and, and understand how the onium theory is far superior. 
Um, so if you like the video, please like, share, subscribe. And if you'd like to support my research and learn more about the onion theory, I have a book on the onion theory for sale, Goodbye Quarks, the Onion Theory. And I will put a link to a couple papers below that also describe it that are available free. And I also have some books on quantum field theory, if you're interested in my quantum field theory research. And so, and I have a Patreon account that I'll give a link below. So thanks for watching.